question dealing with the historical section of the book of 2 Corinthians. And so our question was, according to the following passages, why had Paul been criticized by some in Corinth? We've dealt with the first one in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he was being criticized for not visiting the church there just as he had planned. At the end of 1 Corinthians, he was saying he was going to come with them, stay with them in the winter, and, and uh, he didn't get to do that. And there were various reasons why. And Paul had to explain those to them. But uh, that's, uh, that's something he was criticized for. So let's go to 2 Corinthians 10. And we're going to be up at the front with Bill. Why don't you get verses 7 and 8 and 9. And Tammy can get 10 and 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame, for I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letter. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, such we will also be in deed when we are present. All right, so what was Paul being criticized for here? Uh, uh, by the Corinthians. What had he been criticized for? Okay, in uh, comparison to in comparison to what? You're right. But in uh, comparison I, to what? I, I'm kind of liking this to where some of his letters were building up the church and some of some of his letters were pointing out error. Okay. And this one was pointing out error. And nobody likes to Okay, so there is that. So we do have, we do have uh, people pointing out, okay, Paul's very powerful in his epistles. But what, according to verse 10, were people thinking he wasn't? Because of his looks, his personal appearance, I think they were holding that against him. Yeah. I don't know what Paul looked like. And, of course, it, it seemed like his speech was contemptible. And if you go back to 1 Corinthians 2, uh, we're not going to read it, but you go back there and you're going to find out Paul tells people that he is not very eloquent when he speaks. I didn't come to you with excellency of speech. I came to you with the word of God and power. And so I don't know what Paul looked like, but obviously others knew what he looked like. And they didn't like it. So maybe he didn't look the part of what they were expecting. He didn't sound the part. If you compare him to Apollos, who knows? Uh, and so he's they, they basically, they're saying, you're, when you're present, it, your actions and your looks, and that doesn't match your letters. You're much more powerful in your letters. But when you come here, you, you, you're sort of not the same. And Paul's saying, I am the same. Whatever I write to you, I also I also act upon. I practice what I preach. I may not look the part according to you, but I am doing what Christ wants for it. Kind of reminds me of when uh, before David was going to be king, he's like, "Oh, Eliab, yeah, he he looks like the king. He's, yeah, you know, rugged, yeah, big and strong. Oh no, he wasn't." David, they were looking at the heart, and Paul's letters come from the heart, not from his appearance. Yeah, and it says, you, you in verse 7, you look according to outward appearance. And remember, 
God said, or Samuel, God looks at the heart, as this is word said. Do not look upon outward appearance. Some, some, some people, some men have a very deep voice. I listen to myself online when I have to edit. And I don't have that deep radio voice that uh, some people have, the, the James Earl Jones, Darth Vader type voice, where people just love to listen to people who speak like that. I don't have the radio voice of some preachers. I've always said there, are, there is a way that some preachers, of older time preachers, talk. And it's not that they're using eloquent words. Some of them are. But it's just the way they enunciate their words. And I, I don't know whether it's an accent, but even in, in Canada, I hear some preachers, they talk a certain way. And, and people like listening to that. They don't like listening to someone who stutters or stammers, maybe has a little higher pitched voice. I don't know how many times I've been mistaken over the phone for a woman, but it, it, it's more than I can count on one hand because that's just what people expect. Well, if someone's gonna be put off by my voice, well, that's on them, not on me. Depends what I say. If you can't listen to the message, your heart's not in the right place. And it needs to be corrected. If the message is true, it doesn't matter who the mouthpiece is. Because God will use people, whoever, will teach his message. Yes, Gordon. I just remember watching a movie years ago, and uh, some about a radio contest. And they go to get their tickets from the thing, and the, the guy with the deep, deep, very nice radio voice comes out and he's like, I don't know, four foot something, yeah. skinny, 90 pounds. Yeah. It didn't match his voice. Yeah. So we can't always go by the appearance. Yeah, or at the end of the it's, Wizard of Oz. It's yeah. dirty what's spoken. Yeah. Or at the end of the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, exact same type of thing. So Paul was criticized for that. Let's go to chapter 11. Uh, we'll get verses 7 to 12. Gord, you can get 7 to, 7 to 9. Kala, 11 and 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Seven. 7 to 9 for you, and Kala will get 10 to 12. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I, I was a burden to the, no one for what I lacked. The brethren who came from <clears throat> Macedonia supplied. And in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I kept, I will keep myself. As as the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. But what I am doing, I will continue to do, so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded, just as we are in the matter of which of we are boasting. All right, so what's Paul being criticized for here? Taking money for support. Taking money for support, but specifically from other churches. So he didn't take money from the Corinthians. And Paul makes a note of that in 1 Corinthians 9, that he never did take support from the Corinthians. And he did that for the reason that he didn't want uh, this rich city and probably some of these wealthy people to think he was just out for their money. He didn't want to put a hindrance to the gospel by taking support from the church at Corinth. That was his right. In fact, in Corinth, he worked as a tent maker uh, in order to support some of, his, uh, some of his needs. We know the Philippians sent time and again to his needs, and even the church in Thessalonica from time to time and so, Paul then, because he worked as a tent maker, and because he didn't take money from other churches, why would that have caused them to criticize him? 
You would think, oh, wow, he's not after our money. There's a preacher. Not after our money. Well, it seems strange that they would criticize him for that, but what might you think would be the reason they do that? They maybe think that he favors the brethren in Philippi more. Okay, there is that. There is that. Maybe, maybe he doesn't think of us as worthy enough to to support him in the gospel. Maybe he thinks those are better Christians over there. That's a possibility I hadn't thought of. But that, that's a good one. Anything else? Maybe they don't think that we love them. Okay. Yeah, doesn't think that they love him. In other words, you, you, you don't love us. That's why you don't want to you, you don't want to take support from us. You you love them better. You don't love us. Or I I find that like from a human perspective if that um, Paul's taking support from them, then they might have the attitude, well, uh, he works for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think Paul Paul probably felt that that could happen that he avoided that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, did did want to did want to avoid this 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 stumbling block placing in front of the Corinthians, and perhaps we we find it all the way through, and we'll get to that in chapter uh, eleven and twelve a little bit, or a little earlier on in chapter eleven. His authority is going to be challenged as an apostle, and. We know that preachers often are supported for their work. What is the view of some if a preacher or a congregation works a secular job to support instead of the church supporting them? What could be the view of some? He's not a full-time preacher. Huh? Full preacher, not going to be able to do the work that we need him to do, not spiritual enough, not devoting his full time to, to spreading the gospel. We need someone to be able to do that. Well, we need to be careful of the attitude that we, that we don't go beyond what the scriptures say. It's great to have someone who can devote all their time to spreading the gospel, but sometimes that's not possible. We need the gospel preached. As to who preaches it, it better be someone who knows the word, and if they have to work on the side, so be it. You had something, Bill? I just thought they had a lot of problems mm -hmm. with the Church of Corinth. Maybe they might have thought, well, we really don't have this man in our control. Yeah, that's an important yeah. elsewhere. Uh, who knows? Yeah. They, they seem to do a lot of picking and choosing. Mm -hmm. they, they, they were comparing, I'm sure, Paul to other preachers. That Paul Paul doesn't do what these other preachers do. So does that mean Paul's not the preacher that other preachers are? We know they had affinity for that. Or they pick and chose, they divided over preachers. Who's the better preacher? Who acts more like a preacher? Who's, who does this? Who does that? And Paul always got stuck in last. Uh, Gord? That's, that's kind of uh, an attitude that we shouldn't have. It's a just because we have a full-time preacher does not negate our own responsibilities mm -hmm. of spreading the gospel. Yeah. Just because we are paying or the preacher is getting support from another church because the local one doesn't have enough funds to support it, we still have that responsibility ourselves. Yeah. To spread it. And that that's key. Uh, is maybe maybe these people didn't want the responsibility. Uh, they wanted Paul to take full support from them so he could totally focus on them. They don't have the responsibility anymore. We'll just let the preacher do it, and everything will be fine. That's another attitude you've got to avoid. So that's the last thing. Now let's go to where we're in 2 Corinthians 11. Lisa, you can get 5 and 6. John, do you want to read today? No? So we'll come up to Henry. Uh, for 2 Corinthians 12, you can get 11 to 13. So we'll get verses 5 and 6 of chapter 11. And I'll read Easter, 11 to 13 of chapter 12, and that will be Henry.
All right, so let's skip to chapter 12, verses 11 to 13. I have become the fool in <clears throat> boasting, he have compelled me, for I ought to have commanded, commanded by you, for in nothing was at the hand the most eminent apostles, though as nothing. Truly the sign of an apostle or accomplished among you with all reverence, and signs, and wonders, and majesty. And for what is it in it, or what is it in which you were in fair road to other churches, except that I myself was not a broken stone to you. Forgive me this one. All right, so what's Paul being criticized for here? Or what, what's he, uh, maybe what are the problems that people are seeing in Paul? What's their quibbles? So he did have, um, he did ask God to take away whatever he was going through, maybe his eyes or something like mm -hmm. that. And Paul, and then God said, well, my grace is sufficient enough for you. So maybe mm -hmm. he looks sort of repulsive and he's eternal and so on, and then therefore criticizing his speech mm -hmm. again. And, um, Maybe a little farther than that, along with his speech. Maybe you can compare yourself to Peter or John or some of the other apostles. Paul looked and acted like one all the time. Physically, I'm talking physically, not spiritually. Probably doesn't look like a Peter, speak like a Peter. His authority as an apostle is questioned. <coughs> Paul defends his apostleship all the way through his writings. Why did Paul have to defend his apostleship so much? There's a couple reasons I can think of. One was from his past reputation as a Pharisee. Okay, so he was a Pharisee, and he was a persecutor of the church. So you have to get past your past reputation, and that's difficult. Anyone has a past reputation, it's difficult to overcome that reputation. What else? Wasn't among their, the, the disciples that were better than Peter. Okay. The, the, the apostles that were, the, the, the 12 apostles, were the ones who walked and talked with Jesus. Paul didn't have that advantage. However, Galatians says that he did, was taught by Jesus directly, but not before his death, but after his death. So Paul had everything he needed to know, but he had to convince people that he was selected by Jesus. And he had proofs that would show he was selected by Jesus as well. But I can understand where people are coming from and say, well, you're, you say you're an apostle of Jesus Christ. You weren't like Peter. You weren't like Mark or not Mark, um, uh, John, and, and James, and Andrew. You weren't like those people. You didn't walk with them. How could you be an apostle? And so Paul had to defend that. And he could defend that. He would tell them of where he got what he was teaching, and you could compare it to what the apostles were teaching and the inspiration that Paul had. And so Paul was criticized by the Corinthians uh, for all of these things. And he had to defend himself against all of these things because I'm sure there were some who received the first letter who were upset with what he said. It, it invoked correction in a lot of ways, but I'm sure it caused some unrest among some of the rabble-rousers in Paul. Bill? That's a good example, perfect example of what we talked about last week about forgiving someone that's sin, forgiving someone that was out of the Lord earlier, mm -hmm. because when we don't do that, we affect them, mm -hmm. and they can become overwhelmed with that yeah. feeling, and maybe we're the cause of them giving up again, but with yeah. Paul, Paul had a, a lot of nerve, like he was, they weren't going to affect his faith, yeah. but someone else Another preacher might go, yeah. I better get into something now. Well, yeah, like as far as this, they're, they're 
preachers can often get disappointed. Yeah. They can get disappointed by the brethren. They get disappointed by their family. They can even become disappointed by themselves. And say, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. uh, like as far as that, that uh, preachers sometimes do that when they've been in a congregation for a long time. Or they say, am I really being effective anymore? And so that's why sometimes preachers move. It's not because they've fallen out of love with the brethren, but they believe that the brethren might need a different voice. And so uh, it's, it's uh, we, got, we got to be careful that we're not going to be the cause of someone falling away. We have to point out sin, but when they repent, we need to forgive. If we don't forgive, then really, what was the point on getting them to repent? So that you could show them that you were right and they were wrong? That's not the attitude of Christians to have. We don't hold it over. That's how ch children act. When, when uh, wanting to be arrogantly proven that you're right, or I'm right and you're wrong. It's not the way adults are to act. We need to forgive those who sin against us. Because Christ forgave us. Justin and Gore, before we move on? Well, it's just, you were talking about, you know, uh, that preachers might get to the point where they feel like they're ineffective. And th this is where gospel meetings come in, guest speakers come in, uh, the men teaching mm -hmm. and preaching once in a while. It kind, it kind of breaks that cycle up a little bit. Yeah. Where, where the preacher can sit back and enjoy a message. Because preachers need encouragement, too. Mm -hmm. It's it's not they're the end all say all. Yeah, they have a role as well as the brethren have a role mm -hmm. in service yeah. and in preaching the gospel. So uh, you know, keeping those thoughts in mind, mm -hmm. like say, everybody has a role to play. Yeah, and I'm thankful for uh, COVID at least holding off a little bit uh, because Bill will be speaking next week, uh, and it'll be first time since February of last year. I think you spoke last time too, Bill. <laughs> the, uh, I think it was February of last year when I went to Florida uh, that you spoke on one of the Sundays. But, uh, but it's, the congregation needs other speakers. The congregation needs other speakers to help men grow too. <coughs> it's not just to break up the monotony, but we need to develop speakers, need to develop teachers. So, uh, so that one day, maybe we, this church can appoint elders. Uh, and uh, and the elders that would be appointed are ones that could help shepherd the church uh, uh, correctly. And so Paul's criticized for this, and we need to realize Paul's not going to stand for it. He's going to he's going to apologize if there was anything to apologize for. But at the same time, he's trying to make them feel guilty for even bringing it up because it wasn't sinful to begin with. It's so one thing if you need to repent of some sin that you committed. Paul didn't do anything wrong in any of these points. He can't help how he looks. He can't help what he sounds like. Uh, he wanted to prevent putting a stumbling block in front of them. He couldn't help the fact that he wasn't a follower of Jesus beforehand. As far as it may have been his fault that he didn't obey first, but that didn't mean he was automatically going to be a disciple of Christ, even if he had obeyed before Christ died. And so all of these things are put together. These are quibbles that the Corinthians had that they needed to correct and that they could correct. And they needed to get over. They needed to get over this fixation on preachers and started focusing on the message. So that's the historical section. We'll now take a look at the doctrinal section of this book. What is this book trying to teach us? And there's a very important lesson in this book that Paul tries to get across. And our question for us, how is the superiority of the new, superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant emphasized through the contrast presented in the following passages? So we're going to come up to James. James, do you want to get 2 Corinthians 3, verses 7 and 8? Go up to Tim, you can get verse 9, and Casey can get verses 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 7 and 8, 9 and 10 and 11. And we're going to start with James. We'll just read all through of them. We'll just get through all of them. Now if the ministry of death, praise is carved in the record of the stone, 
came the short glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses in space because of his glory. This was being brought to an end. There will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory. Verse 9, again, 10. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exists much more in glory. So, for even what was made glorious had no glory in the first time, because of the glory that come. For what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. All right, so let's take a look at some, con uh, some contrast Paul's making here. Old Testament versus New Testament. Old Covenant, New Covenant. In verses 7 and 8, what were the contrasts? Two ministries. So it's the ministry of what and the ministry of what? In verses 7 and 8. Ministry of death. Ministry of death. And the ministry of what in verse 8? Spirit. The Spirit. So we have the ministry of death, ministry of the spirit. Which one's the ministry of the death? The old or the new covenant? Old covenant. Old covenant. So that means new covenant, ministry of the spirit. That's quite a that's quite a statement by Paul. That the old covenant, the one that God gave Moses, is a ministry of death. Why is that a ministry of death? No way that our sins could be forgiven. Law of Moses couldn't have meant sin. Law of Moses prepared the way for Christ. It was a tutor that was to bring the Jews to Christ, but an animal couldn't pay the price for the sin that I commit or that anyone committed under the law of Moses. No animal could do that. If an animal could do that, we'd not need a savior. We could just keep offering animals. And, and everything would be okay. But an animal can't take away uh, sins. We needed a savior. So if God didn't provide that savior, the wages of sin is death. So that's what we get. No amount of law that God could give could keep, get, get us to heaven if sin, breaking of that law, couldn't be taken care of. And so the ministry of the Spirit, What is? how is the ministry of the Spirit more glorious? Like, what is the ministry of the Spirit? What does the Spirit do? Bill? I just thought it, it's interesting to remember, you know, there was no forgiveness of sin, but yet God showed them so much of his power. Mm -hmm that they need to remember that but like you said that was to teach them mm -hmm. and, and so now we think of of what he brought to us through the ministry of the spirit my goodness his son died for our sin mm -hmm. so what greater reward and so the ministry of the spirit is revealing that to us the glory of what christ did for us on the cross and the glory of God revealed. Remember, Jesus said, if I do not go, I, I, the Holy Spirit wouldn't come. And that was to the apostles. Holy Spirit came, revealed to us God's will, God's plan for salvation, God's way to heaven. The Spirit revealed all that. The ministry of the Spirit revealed all that. He is continuing to reveal that. Not new ways to heaven, but it's through the, through the Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we could not be saved because we wouldn't have the Bible. We wouldn't have it. We and and yeah, Jesus might have died on the cross, but if nobody knows about it, what good is it? Because the Holy Spirit does that. Verse nine, we have two other ministries. Condemnation and glory. Righteousness. 
So we have, which one's which? Condemnation, righteousness. Condemnation, old covenant. Old covenant, condemnation, new covenant, righteousness. So the old covenant, all it could bring is condemnation. Paul makes that clear in Romans, that, that all the law did was acknowledge you have sin. That's what it did. It pointed out your sin, and it pointed out the fact that you can't do anything about it. We needed something else. Christ came and was righteous, showed us how to be righteous, died on the cross for our sins so that we can be righteous. We cannot be righteous just based on what we do. We can only be righteous because our sins can be forgiven in the blood of Christ. Let's not make a mistake and say that I cannot be righteous. A lot of people think, well, we're all sinners and no one can be righteous. That's wrong. We are all sinners. That's true. But we can be righteous through Christ. Not because Christ's righteousness is accounted to us then just covers up all the sins we do. No. Christ's righteousness help pay the price for sin because he was that perfect sacrifice so God can now forgive our sins and when we have no sin the only thing we can be is righteous that is the only thing but it's not through our doing it's through Christ yes I have obedience that I need to do yes I have that that doesn't earn me anything that's just what I was, what I was doing. So we have the two. And then verses 10 and 11, we have something else. Passing away versus remains. Passing away versus remains. One is passing away. Old Testament, passing away. When someone passes away, what, what, what has happened? We use the word. They are dead. They are no longer with us. The law of Moses is dead. Christ remains. Christ fulfilled all of the law of Moses. That's what he said in Matthew 5. Not one jot or one tittle of this law will pass away until all is fulfilled. Christ fulfilled all. Therefore, it could pass away. That's the connection we need to make to Matthew 5 is not the law wouldn't pass away the law wouldn't be done away with until christ fulfilled all paul's saying christ fulfilled all so what remains is the new covenant that's important that this is a chapter we can turn to do we want to live under the law of death do we want to live under the law of a uh, ministry of condemnation do we want to live uh, on something that's passed away something that's dead is that how we really want to live and there are a lot of people who think that that's the way we're supposed to live ten commandments you, you don't follow the ten commandments you're not a Christian well the problem is the ten commandments are part of the old law yes I'm not to steal I'm not to murder I'm not to worship idols and covet and, and I'm to honor my father and mother. Those are universal commandments. The Jews needed to be reminded of that because of where they were coming from. They were coming from Egypt, where idol worship was rampant, where covetousness was everywhere, where parents didn't honor their mother and father. They needed to be reminded of those things. But do you really think that idol worship was accepted by God before the law of Moses? No, it wasn't. What about coveting my neighbor's wife? No, it wasn't. What about murdering and stealing? No, it wasn't. Now, there was one law in the law of Moses that we don't read of ever being kept before. Which one was? Sabbath day. We read of the seventh day in Genesis chapter 2. But we never read of Abraham keeping it, Noah keeping it, Isaac and Jacob and the 12 patriarchs keeping it. We never read of anyone keeping it until Moses. And in fact, the Sabbath was given to them even before the Ten Commandments 
And they had a tough time uh, adapting to it because they never did it before. Uh, when God gave them manna from heaven, he told them on Friday, on the sixth day, you need to collect double because you're not going to get it on Saturday, on the seventh day. And many didn't heed that warning and they go out on Saturday and there's nothing. And Moses says, what have you done? You were told yesterday to take double. And so they went without food for a day because it was the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was a shadow of the rest that we have in Christ. Hebrews makes that clear. We have a Sabbath, not the seventh day that we observe as a day of rest, a physical day of rest. We have a spiritual rest, a spiritual Sabbath, which is what Sabbath means. Um, and so we don't live under this old covenant. We shouldn't want to. Christ has given us a better covenant. One that will forgive us our sins. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to.